Yeah, we have a pretty good quorum. Quorum. We have about fifteen people. So, so let's get going. All right. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Johannes Polanen. He leads the Laboratory for Hybrid Quantum System at Michigan State University. He's also the Associate Director of the MSU Center for Quantum Computing Science and Engineering, and he founded and is board member of the Midwest Quantum Co-Laboratory. And his experimental group and work uh, deals uh, with different topics at the intersection of condensed matter physics and quantum information science. And today he's going to talk to us about phononic bath engineering of a superconducting qubit. Where is yours? Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, so let me see if I can get this to work here. Thank you all for, for coming to, to this online seminar. I appreciate it. It's, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be able to tell you about stuff that my group is doing. Can, can you all see the slides? Here. Yes, I can see it. And, and also, before you get going, one small question: Is it okay, is it okay if we interrupt with questions? Or you oh yes, um, yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. By all means, please um, okay. feel free to interrupt me during, or if you prefer to wait till the end, I'm happy to to stick around and chat afterwards. Okay. Um, it's totally up to you all. Um, yeah. So so thanks a lot, David. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Johannes Polinen from Michigan State University, uh, and and yeah, I'm going to tell you about work that my group, the Laboratory for Hybrid Quantum Systems, is doing at at this intersection of of condensed matter physics and quantum information science. Today, it's going to be mainly at in the quantum information science regime, um, where I'm going to tell you about work, very recent work that we've done uh, to do kind of open quantum systems research with uh, superconducting qubits um, coupled to phononic baths um, that we have control. Um, over the coupling and the tailoring of the phononic modes that we can we can couple the qubit to. Uh, in particular, I'll tell you about their their um, uh, the phonon the phononic degrees of freedom that, that we're interested in coupling to are are uh, the surface waves on the the surface of piezoelectric crystals. So they're called surface acoustic waves. Um, and you know phonons are a really great um, uh, avenue for for studying open quantum systems. In some sense, they are the quintessential back of condensed matter physics. Um, what's more bath-like than, than a bunch of phonons in a crystal? Um, and so I'll tell you about, about the recent work and results that we've done in, in that arena. Um, so yeah, but, but before I do that, I kind of want to give you a sense of what motivates the, the research in my group and kind of give you a high level view of, of the different kinds of things that we're doing because the superconducting qubit research is only a part of it. Um, so, you know, why do we like these hybrid quantum systems that we study? Um, and by hybrid quantum system here, I mean a system that has, you know, various quantum mechanical degrees of freedom that can interact with each other. So say a sur in, in the work that I'm gonna tell you about today, it's gonna be a superconducting qubit and its excitations and, and a um, microwave frequency surface phonon on a crystal. Um, and we like this because, you know, it's great. I like, I mean, Quantum mechanics was ultimately why I got excited about, about physics and becoming a physicist. And, you know, nature ultimately speaks a quantum mechanical language. Um, these kinds of systems allow us to interact multiple and single uh, quantum degrees of freedom and to study, you know, the, the phenomena and dynamics of, of these quantum systems at the single and collective excitation level. And I think that that is kind of amazing that as a society, as a, as a species, we're now able to do this kind of level of, of science. I think it's just, just awesome. But there's the, there's the potential future applications as well, you know, for, for quantum technologies in the form of simulation, sensing, communication, and ultimately quantum computation. Um, and I think that, you know, my background is really squarely in, in the condensed matter arena and, and quite esoteric aspects of, of many body interacting systems. Uh, and so it's kind of fun that I feel like for the first time in my life, some of the, the things that we're doing in, in my research are actually connected to things that might someday have future uh, potential applications, which, which I think is, is really awesome. Okay. So that's, that's kind of, you know, our, our, motivation and I want to give you just a sense of the different kinds of projects again at a high level that we're working on in, in my research group. Um, so everything that we work on can in some sense be grouped into one of four categories at the moment. So one of the, the areas of active research in our group that I won't tell you about today is um, the study of hybrid quantum systems that involve trapped electrons and the electrons that we trap in these systems are the ones that we can 
uh, place above the surface of a, a very pristine superfluid helium substrate. So we put down a helium substrate, we decorate the surface with electrons, and, uh, and then we have some kind of, say, quantum circuit that lives on the, on the substrate beneath the helium. And then the electronic degrees of freedom, the charge, and ultimately the spin degrees of freedom will, will interact with, with those circuits. And, and we're interested in studying both the single electron and collective phenomena that, that can, be, can be realized in those kinds of hybrid systems. We also have an active area of research in studying the quantum phases of um, matter that can form in electronic low dimensional systems. So like graphene or semiconductor heterostructures, when those systems are cooled to low temperatures and, and subjected to large magnetic fields. That's another aspect of research that, that we have ongoing um, with, some, with some new semiconductor low dimensional uh, systems. Again, I won't tell you about any of that today, but I'm happy to talk about any of these afterwards if you, if you want. Um, we have, we have a, a, an active project studying hybrid quantum systems that can be developed with uh, microwave photonic systems and color center defects in diamond. And the part that I'm going to really focus on in my, in my talk today is our work with hybrid systems involving superconducting circuits. Um, and so that's the, that's the area. But, but, you know, various folks in my group are working on all of these different, different kind of arenas. They certainly keep me busy. Um, now, if at any point in time you get totally bored with what I'm saying or any of the things that, that I'm telling you about, you know, feel free to check out our website at hybridquantumlab.com or you can, if, it, if, if it's the kind of thing that you do, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram and we've got some, there's cool photos and funny tweets and memes and stuff. Okay, so now we can get to the, the actual meat of, of what I want to tell you. So I'm going to tell you about, the, the basic story is, we can make a hybrid system with a, coupling a superconducting qubit to a phononic resonator. But there's, I want to introduce each one of those pieces so that you know where we're going. And ultimately, we want to use this as a platform for, for studying the dynamics and steady state of open quantum systems. Okay. So the superconducting qubits that we utilize in, in my research group are, are probably something you all are very familiar with. It's essentially the 3D transmon architecture. So we have a little qubit on a chip in a, in a, housed in a 3D microwave resonator. And then that, the energy levels of that, of that, we can isolate two of the, the energy levels of that, of that, um, of that circuit, and we can utilize it as a qubit and, you know, perform arbitrary state preparation and tomography to read out what we, what we have. And just to give you a sense on this chip, you know, we have essentially Josephson junction devices, either single or, or squid loop devices that we can we can study um the devices i'm gonna this is you know a single junction so joseph's injunction but in reality we um in the work that i'm going to tell you today we use squid loop so we can tune tune the uh frequency of the qubit with flux and um and then you know we there's no wires or anything in this architecture which is kind of nice and, and fun and easily turned around for for experiments we just couple the the qubit as you can see here um, to these large millimeter scale uh, antenna pads that just free space coupled to the electromagnetic modes of, of this microwave cavity. So we place it in, in the cavity for control and readout, and then we can do any kind of fun qubit experiment we want. Um, but usually, the, as you'll see, the devices are much more complicated than just this single, this single qubit. Oh, right. And, and so the frequencies that we operate in both for, for the qubit, the microwave cavity, and as you'll see for the phononic resonator, they're all in this range of, say, 5 to 10 gigahertz, where, where the temperature scales are, are such that if we place this device into the dilution refrigerator, uh, the mixing, onto the mixing chamber of our dilution refrigerator, it'll just passively cool into its quantum mechanical ground state, and then we can, we can start uh, manipulating it from there. Okay. So just a little bit more about how we actually control and read out this uh, qubit. So as I said, we place it into this microwave cavity and essentially we're just borrowing a page from quantum optics. This, this qubit functions very much like an artificial atom and, and we've placed it into a, uh, an electromagnetic resonator in which we can exchange excitations with it. So by sending microwave signals in through these, these microwave ports here, we can control and read out the qubit. And, you know, all of the physics is essentially governed by the, the James Cummings Hamiltonian, where we have a qubit, the harmonic oscillator degrees of freedom of the, the 
cavity, and then some coupling between these two that allows us to use the microwave photons to manipulate the qubit and, and also to read it out um, via what happens uh, to the microwave transmission of the cavity. Now, I want to just highlight um, that we can operate these kinds of devices in a variety of regimes. Um, if, if, for example, if we operate the, the, this system with the cavity and the qubit, where the cavity and the qubit frequencies are detuned from each other by quite a bit um, relative to their coupling, then we can essentially perform perturbation theory on this James Cummings Hamiltonian. And you can see that we can say, you know, this has essentially all of the ingredients needed for reading out the qubit state um, via the cavity, because what happens is in this, in this regime, the cavity state, which, you know, you group, group terms and you've got this, this first term here, depends on the state of the, uh, of the qubit. So by just reading out what the cavity frequency is, you can, you can determine the state of the qubit. Um, and that's the, that's one of the interesting regimes that, that we operate in. Okay, I think most of that was probably old hat to, to most of the audience here. Um, and I believe you all have had some folks talk about surface acoustic waves in your previous colloquia, but I'm just going to give you a, a quick introduction to these. Um, so this is the next ingredient needed for the, the hybrid system that I'm going to tell you about. So we've got the qubit. Now we need a, a surface acoustic wave or a saw, as they're often called. Um, so these are really just surface waves on the surface of a crystal. That's what a surface acoustic wave is. And if that surface, um, if that, if the underlying substrate on which that surface acoustic wave propagates is piezoelectric, um, then there will be a co-propagating electric field with this um, uh, surface deformation. Um, and this is an elastic wave. You should think about this as very much like a, a wave on the surface of the ocean. Uh, and we can, it, as you'll see, we can uh, fabricate devices that allow us to controllably launch and detect these kinds of surface waves. In particular, the kind of device that, that, that we're going to use is essentially a nanofabricated acoustic Fabry-Perot cavity. So we'll have some interdigitated, so by, by merely placing interdigitated metallic structures onto the surface of this piezoelectric crystal um, and applying high frequency voltages to those, we can strain the underlying crystal and via the reciprocal processes of, of piezoelectricity, we can then you know, detect what happens electrically. Um, and so we'll have this, in these devices, we'll have this central region, the central uh, red region that launches surface acoustic waves to the left and right, and then these metal strips that we just fabricate directly onto the surface of this piezoelectric, and those act like a distributed um, mirror for the surface phonons. And so you should really think about this as like, very much like a Fabry-Perot cavity, except for sound waves. Um, and it turns out there's this whole uh, classical coupling of modes theory that allows us to design these devices to have exactly the properties we want, because it turns out you need these kinds of devices for a lot of classical microwave technology. So they, these kinds of surface acoustic wave devices live inside of every one of our cell phones uh, in the form of bandpass filters and delay lines. Um, and just to give you a sense of, of, of the numbers, here I just wrote piezoelectric, but you can use any piezoelectric that you really want. Um, you can use lithium niobate, which is what we use. Um, you can use gallium arsenide or quartz. We kind of work with all of them. But if you, if you use lithium niobate, then the, the speed of these surface waves is about 4,000 meters per second, um, which means that if you fabricate uh, structures that give you a wavelength of about one micron, you're operating right in the region where where this is close to the qubit frequency, so say four gigahertz. Um, was there a question? I thought maybe I heard somebody raise their hand. If not, I can keep going. Okay, great. So those are the ingredients. Now the question is, is why on earth would you ever want to try to couple these kinds of surface phonon excitations to superconducting qubits? Um, so we are certainly not the only group working on, on in this direction, but there's a lot of interesting reasons why you might want to do this. So one has to do with just the fundamental aspect of being able to control mechanical degrees of freedom, say at the single phonon level. Um, and here they're piezo phonons, so there's this electric component to the, to the phononic excitation. Um, and this in principle allows us to explore uh, new regimes of circuit quantum optics using high frequency sound waves, essentially. Um, and from the technological side, it's kind of neat because the speed of sound is about five orders of magnitude slower than light at the same frequency. And so that means that the, the surface, these, these waves that are propagating at, at uh, say, four gigahertz 
are not, you know, centimeter scale kind of entities. They're at the micron scale. And so in, if you were interested in, say, figuring out how to use surface acoustic waves to, to do all of quantum computing, you could make quite compact resonators um, using superconducting devices. Um, and in fact, there's a number of groups that have been demonstrating that kind of progress. Um, so here I just picked some, some, oh, I should mention one other thing, right? I mentioned that these are at the same frequency as the qubit. The nice thing is, is that if you operate these devices in the gigahertz, you can just passively cool them into their ground state just by putting them in a dilution refrigerator. Um, and there's, there's, here's just some pictures of some of the work that other groups have done. Um, this is by no means exhaustive, but some cool work from, from Andrew Cleland's group and, and from Per Delson's group from some time ago now. Um, and I'll just highlight, there's, there's a number, like I find these particular references to be some of the, the really coolest ones. These are the ones I go to when I really try to remember what, what folks have been up to recently. Um, and, and again, not to be, this is not intended to be, to be exhaustive. There's a bunch of good work from, from other folks, but I think this catches most of the groups that are working on this. I'll mention very recently from UN Chu's group, um, there's a new archive paper out, I think it's about a week old, where they've been able to show that with not surface acoustic wave devices, but a different kind of phononic mode that you can now actually create uh, uh, cat-like states um, using surf using phononic resonators coupled to qubits. So that's, anyway, just wanted to point out. Okay, so I mentioned that, so we're going to design this device to have very specific properties for the open quantum systems research that we want to do. So imagine we've got our surface acoustic wave resonator um, here. Now I want to break this down just a little bit so you get a sense of, of how we think about designing these devices for a, for a given experiment. So, and, and this is all again within the context of this classical coupling of modes theory. So let's break it down. We've got this central IDT. And if we look at the frequency response, IDT here means interdigitated transducer. So if we, if we just had this red central section, we can use this coupling of modes theory to calculate, say, the effective electrical conductance of this device as a function of frequency um, of just the red part. And what you find is that it launches, so essentially this plot, this G here, tells you about how how over what frequency band does the does the interdigitated transducer launch surface acoustic wave energy. And so over here, it launches very little, over here it launches very little, and then it has some broad band of, of frequencies over which it launches surface waves. That's essentially just dictated by the geometry of this thing, of this structure. Okay, so we have that. Now we have the acoustic mirrors. That's these blue metal strips on the surface. And essentially what they allow us to do is to create uh, a situation in which, so this is again, the this is now the simulated or design parameter of the reflection of these mirrors. So we can design them to have a region where the, the acoustic energy is reflected very nicely, say at the peak of this, this plateau here, and then regions where the mirrors are quite leaky. So out here, the, the response is somewhat tr non-trivial, but the, ref so the, the, uh, the reflectivity of the mirrors out here is, is going down and it has a oscillatory pattern to it. And what you should imagine happening is, is that out here, if you have a surface wave, it just propagates cleanly through these, these mirrors. It doesn't, it doesn't get reflected. Now you have these two pieces and it turns out if you want to, if you want to understand the composite response of one of these resonators, you have to concatenate the, the frequency response of these two and then you get the full device. So this down here is the full, essentially the amplitude of the surface acoustic wave excitations that live inside of this resonator. Um, and we've designed this particular device such that it has a very unique feature. It has a single strongly confined surface acoustic wave mode here at like 4.46 gigahertz. Um, and so that's one that gets trapped within these mirrors. And then on either side, we have this like, broad quasi continuum of, of leaky surface acoustic wave energy. And this is, I want to just give you a, a hint. This is going to be the bath that we utilize for whoop, Microsoft crashed. That has not happened in some time. I apologize. Am I still screen sharing? Yes, you're still, you're still sharing. Yeah. I'll get PowerPoint back up and running. Sorry about that. Huh? Fun. Where was I? I was here. Great. Okay, are we back? Everybody happy with that? Cool. Yep. 
All right, so we have this, let me get my laser pointer back on here. So we've got this strongly confined acoustic mode and then this background um, of, of leaky surface phonon states out of the mirror. So the way we're gonna build, now we have all the ingredients that we need for the experiment that I'm gonna describe. So we have the, the surface acoustic wave device, which we're gonna fabricate onto a piezoelectric substrate, looks something like this in a cartoon fashion. We're gonna place some uh, spacer pads on top of this on top of this chip, and then we're just gonna flip a qubit directly on top and capacitively couple these two via the large scale antenna pads that are on either chip. Um, and then that allows us to engineer and understand some kind of crazy Hamiltonian that includes both um, qubit excitations and and um, acoustic modes in this in this uh, uh, in this saw resonator. Okay, so here's here's an actual picture of what the real device in this experiment looks like. Here's the here's the surface acoustic wave uh, um, device on the lithium niobate. And if you zoom in here, you can see this interdigitated transducer and then the mirrors on either side. And then we flip chipped that onto a qubit, uh, a flux tunable qubit and housed it in a, in a 3D microwave cavity made out of copper. And again, these pads serve kind of dual purposes. So they, they allow us both to couple the qubit and the saw device capacitively to one another. Um, and, it's, and it's relatively straightforward to simulate the, the coupling and everything. Um, but they also allow us to, as you'll see, we can independently, it turns out, populate the saw resonator with phonons just via free space coupling to this cavity. Okay, so let's take a look at what the data looks like when you actually take that kind of device and cool it down. So here on the left, I've just plotted, again, the, the simulated response of the device. This is what we wanted to happen. So we have this strongly confined acoustic mode and then this bath of leaky surface acoustic wave excitations on either side. And then if we perform spectroscopy of the qubit of, of this hybrid system by tuning the transmon frequency with flux, what we see is a strong avoided crossing uh, right at the region where we designed this, um, uh, the, the, the well-defined confined mode in the resonator. And then you can see these fringing patterns on, on the high and low frequency side of this avoided crossing. And what these correspond to is this leaky surface acoustic wave energy. And here, what we actually think is happening is, is that the qubit is blinking in and out of existence um, as, it, as it loses its excitations very, you know, it's relatively strongly coupled to the, to the, um, uh, to the surface acoustic wave resonator. And it just, the, you put an excitation in the qubit and it just blinks out of existence. So this is in some sense, the, um, the bad cavity limit of circuit QED, but in the acoustic regime. Um, and these are just line cuts at various, at various frequencies here. And, and I didn't put it here, but we essentially get about the, the coupling that we extract from this is about 13 megahertz. So here the, the surface acoustic, this strongly confined acoustic mode and the qubit are coupled at about the 13 megahertz level. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight one aspect that's that about this device that is related to what I was saying before. So imagine we can, we, one of the cool things that we can do with this device is we can say park the qubit way over here where we're, where the qubit looks like a qubit and it's not strongly interacting with the, with the um, surface acoustic wave resonator. And simultaneously we can apply a, a microwave frequency tone right at the frequency of this, of this, um, uh, acoustic mode that we've strongly confined within the mirrors. And if you remember from that dispersive coupling picture I showed you in, in the James Cummings Hamiltonian, we can essentially, if we can populate the resonator with phonons, um, then those should act very much like the bosons of the electromagnetic field that we use in the cavity. And they should produce a, um, a star, AC start shift uh, on, the, the, um, on the qubit. There's, there'll also be a lamb shift, which is what this term is. We don't see this, but but we're gonna we're gonna apply varying amounts of power to the tone that we use to excite the surface acoustic wave and measure what happens to the qubit frequency. And and in principle, there should be a shift, and in fact, there is. Um, and so here, what I'm for for varying amounts of power, we can shift the qubit frequency by you know many tens of megahertz. And and from our you know simulation of the the uh, just doing perturbation theory, we can extract a mean uh, phonon number that 
over here, which is about six. So for about six phonons, you get 15 megahertz of shift. Um, okay, so cool. That's That all shows that we understand roughly what, what is going on with this device. And other people have seen similar things in various acoustic devices. None of this is, is all that uh, revolutionary by any means. But what we what I really want to get to is is I want to go to a regime where we're now very far away from that strongly confined mode. And we're in a regime where the acoustic response of the device is leaky. So the mirrors leak surface phonons out. Um, and here the green is again the simulation based on what we designed the device to do in the coupling of modes theory. And the blue data here is one over T1 of the qubit. And as you can see, it tracks very well with the the um, what we would expect for the conductance of surface phonons out of the mirror to be. And so essentially what this shows us is that we can tailor um, and dominate the qubit loss by uh, the emission of surface phonons out of the, the mirrors. Okay, so that's cool. Um, and now we have the ingredients needed to do open quantum systems research. So what we want to do is we want to have the qubit and we have some coupling to the surface phonons um, in some controllable fashion. Um, as they leak out of these these mirror excitations, and you know, you normally think of these open quantum systems as as you know, in most kinds of situations, you think of, of loss and um, and interaction with an environment as being deleterious for a quantum system. But in certain contexts, it can actually be uh, a resource, and you can use it to understand the dynamics and the steady state of of how a quantum system interacts with its um, with its environment at the at the level of you know the density matrix and and how the dynamics of that evolves, and so this is this is what we wanted to do, and in, we have one other ingredient which is we actually have to apply a drive to the qubit. So we we take the qubit and we apply a, a resonant or a detuned drive to to essentially form, perform Robby flops of the qubit, and in in that driven frame we then place the qubit in some, we place the driven qubit in interaction with the, the surface phonon loss. And as you'll see, we can use that for arbitrary state stabilization um, of that in, in that driven basis. And then we simulate the whole thing with the Markovian master equation and, and try to understand, can we understand the, the, again, the dynamics and the steady state of the various qubit expectation values. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the name of the game with this open quantum system research. And actually, you know, there's a number of different superconducting efforts that that inspired us to do this kind of work. Um, uh, some of them from, from here, um, from Professor Siddiqui's group and and our collaborator Kater Merch. Um, but yeah, it's it's essentially the name of the game is to try to understand this this interaction of the qubit with its with its environment. Um, and here, the environment is the the phonons which we can control the coupling to. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to drive the qubit, and we're going to actually in this in this is the data. What I'm going to I should state here that in that in the data that I'm about to show, we're placing the qubit kind of right over here where where t1 is varying as a function of frequency uh, quite sharply uh, with with uh, frequency. Um, and if we do that, what happens is we start driving the qubit. One way to view it is you know in the in in the the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in the driven system are no longer the zero and one states of the qubit, but they're the plus and minus x states for, say, zero detuning. And then these two will experience, these two um, uh, driven eigenstates will experience differing loss if we can, if we can make t1 of the qubit vary over a, a frequency that's um, sharp compared to, say, twice the Robby frequency. And in that situation, um, the one of the one or the other of the qubits will be stabilized as phonons are emitted um, from the the resonator, and and here's just the expectation values when we do that of the qubit sigma x y and z as a function of you know the drive duration and the points here are the data and the the um, uh, the dashed lines are the simulation based on the Markov Markov master equation and. As you can see, there's really good agreement. Essentially, we have no fit parameters. All the things that we feed into the into the simulation are measured values of the hybrid system. Um, and from these, oh, wow, Microsoft is really not liking me today. That's hilarious. I apologize again for the, the technical difficulties here. Um, just one second. 
Hopefully we can get through the rest of this without any more crashes. Um, but yeah, so we can take these expectation values then and calculate essentially the state purity um, in of, of this, you know, in the driven dissipative system that, that we've engineered. And we find that in the steady state, we get something like 85% purity, which is quite good. So we're, we're driving the system and it's evolving naturally to some point on the blocks here um, with, with quite high purity. So the, a completely mixed state in the presence of, you know, um, you know, completely symmetric phonon loss that doesn't care about, you know, what state you have prepared would be sitting here at the center of the block sphere, but we're preparing something, you know, that has quite, is, is almost at the surface. And we think that if we, with modest improvements to our device, we can push this to like 99%. Um, now, one thing that's kind of interesting, another way, another perspective that you can view this in is these, these driven eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are, are uh, of the qubit Hamiltonian are split by quite a small frequency. So like say, give or take 10 megahertz, which is a low temperature. So 20 megahertz corresponds to, um, you know, give or take uh, uh, a millikelvin. And if we work out the detailed balance for, for this state purity, what this essentially means is that we're cooling this, this state here uh, to about 900 microkelvin effectively, living in you know the 10 millikelvin environment of the dilution refrigerator, just by you know preferentially emitting phonons out of the the resonator. Okay, so just to give you a sense of you know we can do more than just pick you know I showed you one value of Rabi frequency drive and one detuning, but we can actually vary both the detuning and the Rabi frequency, and we can vary where we place the qubit relative to this this um, tailored loss uh, channel. So if we put the qubit say right here, where essentially if you drive it, the two driven eigenstates of the the Hamiltonian are roughly experiencing similar loss, you get this kind of um, and this is again, the color scale here is sigma x. So we're just, I'm just showing you one of the expectation values. It has this kind of trivial structure, but if we place ourselves here where the, the um, uh, loss has this kind of uh, negative slope, then we move this line, this, this region here where, where uh, the color scale is white is called this characteristic uh, line of zero coherence where essentially the two jump operators in the, in the, uh, driven dissipative system cancel each other out and you don't get any state stabilization. Well, you get this, but, but if you're off of that, then you you get either positive or negative values of sigma X. And then if we position ourselves over here, then we can flip the sign of that and, and controllably get any uh, state stabilization we want in this driven uh, situation. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's essentially the, the, the main result here. I, so I mentioned also that we can do this, this Markovian uh, master equation simulation. So if I take that data in that last plot where I showed sigma x as a function of both the Rabi detuning and Rabi frequency, um, we can also perform again the full uh, simulation based on the master equation and we get really good agreement with, with the data um, that we take. So, and we can you know, do this again for sigma y or sigma z. Um, and, and you know, I, I should have mentioned this a little bit earlier, but essentially the way the measurement is made is we drive the system and then immediately uh, for varying amounts of time, for varying amounts of preparation, and then we perform state tomography on the qubit. So we just measure the expectation values of sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, and then repeat. Um, and these dashed lines are just, you know, some line cuts to get a sense of, of what the data actually looks like. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope what, what this has shown you is that, that this kind of phonons are sort of the quintessential bath and a really wonderful platform for studying um, open uh, phononic quantum systems. And uh, that, you know, we've shown that, that this kind of surface acoustic wave uh, phononic dissipation can be used to prepare and stabilize arbitrary qubit states on the, on the block sphere. And um, this really leads to some opportunities we think in the future for for uh, engineering effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonians uh, in the presence of, of this kind of phononic loss. Uh, so, so the result that I just told you about, you can read about, it's up on the archive. Um, here's the result, it's, you know, um, it's called, it's the same as the, the title of the, the talk and the slide. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun and it seems to, to, to mostly make sense. Um, 
so that was really all I wanted to tell you. Um, but I do want to highlight, you know, I, I get to come here and tell you about this cool result, but, but actually these are the folks in the lab, um, in my research group that do all of the, the real heavy lifting in, in getting these kinds of experiments going. Um, in particular, I want to call out a uh, grad student, Joe Kitzman, who's really been spearheading uh, the, the work that, that, that I talked about today. Um, but yeah, the, that's, that's the folks. And, and finally I'll thank, you know, there's a number of people at MSU that, that, you know, I interact with a ton. Um, a lot of this was inspired by, you know, conversations and, and interactions with my good friend and, and, and collaborator, Gator Merch. Um, and of course, none of this would be possible without the, the support from the funding agencies that, that, are, are absolutely essential to the kind of work we do. Now I'll mention just two other small things. As, as David said at the beginning, um, at Michigan State, we partner with the University of Michigan and Purdue. Uh, we have this Midwest Quantum Collaboratory. And at MSU, we have a new center for quantum computing science and engineering. And so if, you know, you're, if there are any undergrads in the, in the, in the talk and that are interested in, you know, future graduate student, graduate school opportunities or people looking for postdocs, you know, these are great places to, to have a look. But um, yeah, and, you know, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions you have. And sorry again for all the, the technical issues, but, but okay, thank, you, thank Johans. you for having let's, me. Let's virtually clap for Johans. And let's see, are there any questions or comments from, from the gallery? All right, I'll ask one maybe. Um, thank you, Johannes, for the nice talk. So uh, my question is, are there uh, certain dynamics that you think would be unique to acoustic uh, paths as opposed yeah. to microwave paths? Yes. Um, so without giving away too much, one of the, you know, I mentioned earlier this business about um, uh, uh, about the speed of sound being five orders of magnitude slower than than um, the uh, speed of light at the same frequency. So that gives, you can actually design devices that have quite long transit times for the phonons in the, in the system. And so then, you know, instead of simulating things in terms of, of Markovian dynamics, you can actually introduce non-Markovianity into the system. And that's one thing that we're pushing on right now. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think yeah, that's yeah, one yeah. of the that's things that I think is, what I was going for. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's exactly right. I think that's one of the, the cool things that you can do with these devices kind of off the shelf. When you mentioned at the end on her mission, Hamilton, is, oh, yeah. there, is there any particular problem you have in mind? So we were just thinking, you know, we realized that we have many of the similar ingredients that are needed for, so you, to engineer some of, so one of the cool things is these, these non-effective, they're, they're, you know, the world, the universe is ultimately Hermitian, at least yeah, as yeah. far as we understand, right? And, and so it's really just a matter of f figuring out which part of the system you call the system and which part you call something else. And, and that, the thing that you've relabeled as the system can be the non-Hermitian part. And... So we realized that with the transmon operated essentially as a three level qubit, we can use the higher level states as, as, um, as, the, as the qubit states. And then if you can control the loss in a systematic fashion, like we can with the surface acoustic waves, you can engineer um, Hamiltonians that have an imaginary part. Um, and we've just started scratching the surface on exactly, it turns out that this, all this simulation business of the master equation, it works in the other direction too. So you can actually start thinking about how to design experiments based on the results of the, the master equation. Um, and then the neat thing is, is that the ones that we're trying to look into have these, um, potentially these exceptional points where eigenvalues become, uh, imaginary and eigenvectors become degenerate with one another and and you can start seeing kind of that kind of open quantum system stuff you, i don't know if you're at we don't i don't have a particular hamiltonian exactly in mind i just we realize that we have the ingredients necessary to, to engineer yeah, yeah, yeah. various but, but this thing you this thing you mentioned about using the other levels it, it, it's interesting yeah any other questions or comments yeah is there a quick question uh thanks johannes that was a great talk um so I was wondering, 
uh, in terms of the physical location of the coupling, how localized the coupling between the bath and the qubit? Um, in particular, I was thinking, okay, let's say we have a multi-qubit system. Could you have localized bath engineering? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. So we're doing this all in this 3D architecture, which is cool. everything's gigantic. But you people have, you know, Cleveland's group has shown that many of these things can be done in, in 2D geometries where you have local couplers that, yeah, yeah, I don't see why not. I think it could very easily be, it's just a matter of how, crea how creatively can you design the circuit. Um, so you can use, they're using predominant, they're using like, like qubit, cubic light couplers to to mediate the coupling so it's inductive or or and here we're really it's really a little bit brute force with these large scale antenna pads but you can make the couplings very small um that satzinger paper that i mentioned has a lot of their details about how they do the coupling is that answer your question or did yes. i butcher it yeah no, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah other questions Okay, if not, then let's thanks Johannes again. Great talk, man. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. See you. In